So we're going to look through your code uh, in the blog post that you wrote. And the blog post was taking, like I said before, from um, work done by John Schwabish um, with kind of guidelines for making effective tables. Um, you go through in your blog post 10 of them. I'm going to go through um, some of the, I forget, maybe like five or six, some of the ones that seem kind of um, simplest and kind of most relevant starting out. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of run through some code, ask you some questions, and then we'll take it from there. Um, so I am going to, um, import your data. Um, and we are working, I can just pop it up here on data on yield of various crops in different countries over time. Uh, cool. So, um, I'm going to run this code chunk here, bring in data. You, you filter to um, a few countries, these countries here, and then only potatoes and only for a few years. And so if I even pop up the potato data, you can see that. Um, now, let me go ahead and run. So the, the first kind of um, principle is offsetting the headers from the body. Um, so let me actually run what you call a poor example. And so maybe if you want, first of all, um, and we'll go back to the code, but maybe just talk for a second about what makes this a poor yeah. example. Number one, I think uh, when you're prepping the data, there's some decisions you have to make in terms of, uh, you can imagine that a tidy uh, data set where you have like each variable um, kind of in its own column and each observation in its own row is great until you need to make a uh, summary table. So you kind of need to break the rules in a good way and make the data set wider. Uh, when you were showing the yield data, it already looked like a decent table. Like if you click on that view or uh, the potato data, sorry. Um, so you're going from this long format to a wider format. Like that looks like a table. That's a tabular format. It's grouped by country, crop, uh, potatoes is repeated, and you have your different years. So that just making that decision is like your first step of like, how do you want to orient the data to show it off? And I think, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that's a really, really important point that a lot of us who work in data sometimes miss because especially if you work with a tidyverse, you're so used to having your data in that typically longer tidy format, but understanding that for presentation, that might not be the best, I think. Is you get really to bend key. the rules for your so presentation like that you, later, that you for sure. Exactly. Exactly. No okay. Worries. Sorry. Yeah, so so uh, going back to go, this table, I think number one, like we, we talked about these poor and good examples. I basically had to break some of the good things that GT does out of the box. If I just called GT on potato data, uh, it would actually do a pretty decent job of making a basic table. So you could actually highlight potato data GT um, line 61 and 62 just and like run those. Um, and it will give you a pretty decent basic table you know it's got line separators so Go ahead. <laughs> well i was just going to say so you actually wrote code to Absolutely. make it work yeah so i saying. actually had to write additional gt code to make these what i call poor examples and it's not because they're the worst it's just you're making it harder on telling your story or having the reader get there and basically understand things so what this bad example is actually doing is removing all of the line separators and giving you essentially numbers on a white canvas. So now if you run line 70 potato table, um, it'll give you what I call like the bad example. You can probably figure out that there's a column called country and that there's some years from 2013 to 2016. But there's nothing guiding you to say, hey, this is where the table begins and you're looking at values versus variables. Um, and because you're moving from long format to wide, you really have to guide folks to be like, what's the purpose of this table? Am I trying to compare within a country across a year? Am I trying to compare within a year across country? You can basically structure the table in a way that it guides the reader to make those decisions. So... It's all white space. Cool. If we go to the next portion with the improved example, I've basically like added back in some of the capabilities that are made with GT. 
is you can run this. And now we've made an intentional decision that basically like the most important thing here is letting people know that there's multiple years and that there's a country column. And then you have the data set below it. You could still add, you know, light horizontal lines breaking up between the countries. But the way that I read this table is we're comparing within year across countries um, because there's nothing really separating the individual rows. There's just the header being separate from the body of the table. And that's, again, it, it might sound yeah. silly to like make that small of a distinction, but it makes a difference in terms of the end result. And so looking at your code, it looks like mm -hmm. you changed a couple things because I saw this line here, which um, is in contrast to this, where you did ex um, op table lines extend equals none. And so there are no lines between tables, whereas down here um, you set the default, which appears to be to have a line uh, below the header um, and then at the bottom of the table. Um, and I know you did some other things here. Um, and then you did one other thing, which is in this uh, tab style, you um, said weight equals bold, and then locations highlights just the right. the header. Um, are there other things you would highlight that you did to to make the, the header kind of distinct from the yeah, rest I of mean, the table? Yeah, I mean, you hit kind of the nail on the head there in terms of the previous example had removed all the lines. If you'd actually just execute like 81 to 88 and stop at op table lines, it will add in uh, gray dividers. So that's kind of the default behavior. And I think that's actually pretty good. Like if that's your baseline, that's what GT does out of the box. That's pretty good. That guides the reader to say, I'm comparing within country across here, right? Because there's a line separating uh, horizontally, but nothing vertically. When the tab options, um, basically that is removing those lines and hiding them further so that kind of the data to ink ratio is higher and potentially even too high uh, in terms of like, if you run the rest of the code, it removes that horizontal line. And I think it then guides the reader to do more of vertical comparison because uh, you have nice columns. You're like, oh, okay, well, it looks like uh, United States has the most crop yields in 2013 and 16 and, and 14 and 15. Like I'm comparing across country for those years. Yeah. And so it looks like you did a lot mm -hmm. like here, setting the colors of the border of the grid lines to be white, which obviously makes them not show up on a white background. Cool. Um, all right, let's uh, move on and let's look at um, the next uh, guideline is about using subtle dividers. So let me, um, this is just bringing in some data. I can even look at the data, rule to data. Um, let me go ahead and just run this code and let's talk about um, what is not ideal. Yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah. So again, I, I'm kind of building up this thing piecemeal by piecemeal. So while the first example is going to be pretty rough. And that's what I see here. Like this is similar to a lot of the tables I see in the wild where I've accomplished my goal. My check mark is completed. I have tabular data in a tabular format and it's been saved out. But just like before, you know, we like didn't have any dividers. Now we've gone way too far and added dividers everywhere. Like your, your eye doesn't know where to go, even though you have dividers. Um, the other thing to me is that I haven't done a good job of highlighting things that are different than the other variables. So you may think, oh, it's 2007 to 2016, when in reality it's 2007 to 2011, then the average of those five years, then 12 to 16 in the average of those years. And then at the very bottom, there's an additional row now that's averaging all the columns as they go down. So without separating those out, you know, again, you're, you're making the reader work harder to figure out, like, what am I supposed to be seeing here? Like, what's exciting? What's the story? Yeah. So let's look at then how you did it. Um, I know I commented out one thing. I'll have to look yeah, back. Yeah, this, this brings um, up a good point. So that makes sense. We can leave it off for now. So this first step is essentially okay. what we did before add some bold to the column header so you know, oh, these are the headers, it's years all the way across, and then adding a big divider line to say, hey, 
that country average is the average. Don't think of it like one of the other countries. It's the average of everything. Um, so it needs to be separate visually from the other components. But the part that we left off, basically that tab styling to further enhance the table, if we re-execute that, uh, then now we've highlighted That's that there's these average columns uh, across the rows as well. So, you know, not only do you have to think about the headers, but even within the data, you might want to style the backgrounds to extend those, either push them to the background and, and don't think as much about them or just really make sure, oh, hey, don't accidentally think this is just another year or lose sight of it in the rest of the data. That makes sense. And so for that, this code here, you are, it's, so it's all within this mm -hmm. tab style that, allows you to to set that style and you're saying you want cell fill to be a light gray which is obviously what's showing up here and then you identify the places uh where that happens um and you want it on the variables called average 07 11 and average 20 uh 12 16 um cool so that's how and we I, get that i think to point out um, like with tab style, the reason why it's so powerful is it's not uh, not necessarily always, you know, go to cell A1 and click color on it, but do the whole column at once. Like I'm not having to say which rows, just do all the rows in these columns. And you can even extend it further to say mm -hmm. when a condition is matched, do something. So like if the value is greater than 19, yeah. highlight it. So it's a way of doing some exploratory data analysis for the reader in terms of like, hey, these values are something for you to pay attention to, or they're higher than they should be or outside of a normal range. So you can do a lot with styling of the table with tab style. Cool. And to, to show that even more, you use tab style mm -hmm. here, for example, you are um, doing things like setting the making your right. grid lines vary right like like you said similar to what you did before having the grid lines be thicker here um did you oh so you don't have to set your grid lines different here because the i'm default. assuming that's using the default grid lines okay so you're only changing it where you need to make it different than the that default exactly. kind of like so you're gray. basically is that is that the idea the default would have gray like a pretty thick gray at the top and then very thin light gray lines as horizontal dividers if you go to line 204 i think yeah so now there's only the light that gray dividers um but if you look at lines see, 204 yeah. through 206 so, um you'll notice that we're using you know across all the columns, but only within rows where the country is equal to average. So you have this like logical statement saying, look at the data for me, GT, like look at the data behind the scenes and I where see. this condition is matched, do this for me. So a lot That's of power right. there of like using the data cool. to influence what the table looks like itself. Cool. And actually, you know what? Let me then skip ahead to mm -hmm. highlighting mm -hmm. outliers because you do something similar there. Actually, let me keep an eye on the time. Um, I'm realizing actually it's almost yeah. 10, well, 10 my time. Um, I can stay, you have, I can stay around you for need, a while. Do you, should I let you go? Okay. Um, if you're okay, I'm realizing I should probably schedule <laughs> these an hour and a half. <laughs> this is the second one I've done and it's, they're both gone over. So That's if good. you do need to go, just let me know. Um, so with highlighting outliers, I'm going to run this to get your data. Just take a quick look at it. Uh, okay, so we got countries and then several years. And again, we're looking at potatoes. Um, so I'll run this. Um, and then um, let's look at it without any highlight. So um, with this, it's it looks really similar to the tables we saw up above um but just let me actually run it with the highlighting to kind of show like what what you um the guideline gets at in terms of um you know good presentation of data so talk about what what's going on here and then we'll talk about how you actually totally. implement it with so here what we're looking at is we've kind of gone back to the original data without averages 
and we're looking at some of the changes over time. Basically, like, you know, did it go down or up and year over year? Um, what we're doing here with color and with GT is saying if any value is less than zero, show it as red. Basically pretending that that's a really big deal or maybe it's not that big of a deal, but you just want to make sure people realize, hey, this is a negative value. You might want to pay attention to it. Um, and you can make these decisions with whatever logic statement you want. I've just said, you know, within this column, if the value is less than zero, then highlight it for me. You could easily make it the background of the cell instead of the, the font being colored, or you could add in like an image there and change it to something else. You could do whatever you wanted. Gotcha. And so you're doing that mm -hmm. um, here. You're saying style, um, cell text, color equals red. Uh, and then here you're defining all of the places where that should happen. So basically this row mm -hmm. all the way to the end. So just to give an example then, and let's see if I can do this because I don't actually use um, GT Beautiful. that much, but that, that did work actually. So that will change it. So it'll now fill the background as opposed to. And I text. think that's the beauty of cool. code is you can like change a component and reuse the bulk of it. Um, with making this decision between like the font color versus the background color, you can really see like, this is saying only pay attention to the negative values, right? Like that's basically all your eye is doing. Yeah. So you could change the color to be something lighter, like maybe a pink or an alpha, or right. maybe that's intentional. You're like, hey, this is a bigger table. I really want people to just see like, look at all these values where we're failing or where things are going down. So if I wanted to change multiple things, would I do something... Uh like this, so I could do like, uh, cell, or no, what was it? Cell text, uh, color mm -hmm. equals white. Does that work? Ah, okay, perfect. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, that is really easy to switch from nice one work. thing to the next. I, I will say that, I didn't yeah. actually know how to That's do that because awesome. I don't use That's GT. That, like it, <laughs> that was not me pretending. Yeah. Interface, I hope. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk now about alignment. Um, so John Schwabish, John Schwabish talks about right aligning numbers and values in the header row. Um, so the data that you use here is um, really simple, just one year looking at various crops uh, in the US. And then you actually make a table that shows various options. Um, with the numbers left aligned, the numbers center aligned, and the numbers right aligned. So talk about, first of all, why you think right, you and John Schwabish uh, agree that right aligning Absolutely. numbers is yeah. better. So ultimately, while I think that tables are a useful visualization tool at some level, ultimately the basic purpose of a table is to show exact values. A graphic, you can estimate exact values like be like, okay, this X, Y coordinate is approximately this. But with a table, you're literally looking at exact numbers and you're trying to compare them or look at the numbers between rows, or between columns. With numbers and the way that, uh, at least in an English uh, speaking kind of community or uh, large portions of America, you're looking at numbers from left to right and classically are right aligned. The reason they're right aligned is you can compare at the same decimal place. So if you look at the right align or the furthest right column and hover over that, uh, you can see that the decimals are perfectly in a straight line. So whether the number is big, 48.64, or small, like 3.49, they still align with each decimal and each number is in their own little column within the column. And importantly, some numbers are wider, like a four is actually much wider than a one. So this is using a um, kind of equally spaced font so that whether it's a large number, or a small number, a thin number, or a wide number, they all align within the right column. So right alignment works here. If we break this alignment and go against the rules that are baked into GT, we can look at center alignment and you can see that it's actually starting to be kind of hard to see where things align. Your ones start getting really thin, 
and you know things are a bit muddier. You're like, well, is 11.74 bigger than 811? Oh, that's 8.11. You know, you're you're over the place. And it's even worse if you go to left align because now all the units are aligned, but your first digit is nonsense. You know, two is not bigger than 48, but the number 2.06. The two there is in the same column as the four and 48. So now your comparison between values is, is very difficult. And are you saying, so I know you actually have a section mm -hmm. on choosing appropriate fonts for tables, which we're not actually going to talk about today, but are you saying with right aligning, does it space the numbers differently if you do right align versus center align or what what's going on there that makes them yeah so, so there, there's when two right aligned? types well there's many many different types of fonts but i'll talk about two or three um you have a classical font where you just like is it serif or sans serif like does it have decoration or no decoration mm -hmm. uh, beyond that there's things called monospaced fonts monospace means every character in that dictionary so A through Z, zero through nine, as well as decimal places and other things like that are all the same width. So whether it's a period, a one or a zero, they all uh, take up equal width within that row. Um, these are not true monospaced fonts because the decimal places are thin, but they are equally distant for characters and numbers. Um, if you wanted to, you could do, um, at the end of this table, opt table font. And I think we can do, uh, let's see, font equals, I think courier or courier new is baked into most operating systems. Let's see if we can find that one. Yeah. So now this is a monospace font. Um, and while the units are all the same, uh, in terms of like with that, Font we we're looking at before, you might see that the decimal place actually takes up more uh, space on the screen here uh, than it did before. That's because not only do the numbers and characters all one unit across, but decimal places, commas, dollar signs, whatever, those are all also one unit across. Um, GT's default font is a, I'm forgetting the actual term, it's not monospaced, but all of the characters and numbers are equally distant. Great. So it works. It works yes. well, especially when you write align it to be able to to compare. Cool. So in contrast to um, right aligning for numbers, um, you talk about John Schwabish's, Schwabish's suggestion to left align um, text and headers. So in other words, text within the body of a table as well as any um, header rows. So same thing, maybe just if you can talk briefly about why um, that's yeah. a better and, and some way of this is go. specific to locale. Like you could imagine in uh, countries or societies where you read right to left, you might actually do the inverse. But for this English format that we have, uh, based out of like my experience in home country here in the United States, we're reading left to right. Um, the reason why we're doing that for basically character strings or factors, as we see here is that you might have varying links. Like most numbers are around the same number of precision, like the same number of decimal places, and you can decimal align and that's useful. For text, reading it left to right, if we start from the leftmost column, which is actually the right alignment, you can see that your eye is actually having to bounce from the left to farther right, to way left, to way right, when you're reading down. So from British to Cayman, not too bad. From Democratic Republic of Combo, to Luxembourg, you're moving very far to the right and going back and forth. Uh, so you're basically like your starting point is varying between every single row. And when you do that on like a larger table, it makes it worse. For uh, center alignment, I actually find this even harder to read personally um, because you don't have a similar ending or start point. You're starting in the middle of a word and nobody starts from the middle of a word. You might start from the right, you might start from the left, that's appropriate. But starting from the middle, you're bouncing, you're not even making real words. You're like starting at the M in Luxembourg. Like you want to either do Luxembourg or in different languages reading from the other side. For the left alignment, 
now your words are all starting from the same place. They might end in different places, but when you're looking down, you have a comparison, the starting letter or the length of the word. But regardless, you know, British came in, Democratic Luxembourg, United Germany, New Costa Peru. Like I can go through that very quickly and my eyes are only moving vertically. I'm not having to bounce to start to read through all those different lines. Cool. That and, makes a ton of sense. And so oh, just I was going to say, like, the... when you're looking Sorry, at this ahead. code, I am, again, breaking the rules of GT. GT will always default to having text as left right. aligned, numbers as right aligned, and uses good default fonts. But you can bend or break these rules in certain situations. So here I can say, like, take this column and align it left or align it to the center or align it to the right. And there are specific small scenarios where that's appropriate. Um, you can imagine uh, like year. It's always 2000, 2001, 2015, 2022. At least for a long time, it's always going to be four units, right? So whether you right align it, left align it, or center alignment, everything's always going to be perfectly aligned because all of the uh, strings are the same length. So that's a way where center alignment might actually give you better spacing of the columns and everything still stays aligned. That makes sense. So if you do want to break the rules, like you said, GT does a really nice job yes. of giving you kind of good defaults. But if you do want to break the rules, mm -hmm. it looks like it's these lines here that show how you can manually set alignment with the calls align function. And you give it whatever alignment right. you want, tell it what column or columns, and it'll do it for you. Cool. Let me just see a couple... Cool. Yeah, so we'll just do two more, and then I'll ask you about um, GT Extras. So, um, all right. The next principle is thinking about the appropriate level of precision. Um, let me run your code. Uh, um, and you talk about um, the this chart, or sorry, this table here. Um and you talk about you know how you would identify whether you're showing too many decimal places, too few, or as you put it, about right. Um, first of all, how do you how do you make that decision, and what how do you know yeah, what is? So I would say uh, part of this right. is your domain expertise, or uh, if we're falling back to scientific principles, the accuracy of your tool. Um, you know, I can have a tool that weighs things in pounds. And that's its maximum accuracy, not ounces, not grams, but pounds. If I take two humans, one who weighs 115 and someone who weighs 130 and I average them together, um, I might get something where it's like, oh, it's 121.1678425 pounds or whatever. Like the, the, the average of those two numbers adds all this accuracy that your tool actually is not appropriate for. It's not giving you that level of precision. So while you can make it round and, and be more aggressively rounding or less aggressively rounding, um, part of that is your decision. Uh, there's the visual component where, you know, writing 17.6666, like, is that 66 at the end adding much to what the reader is getting out of it? Maybe if that's the case, you need to change your units and it should be like uh, 1760.66. My, my default behavior is I should have like one or two units of decimals unless my tool or domain expertise says more or less are appropriate. Um, if I aggressively round like the too few decimals in the middle, uh, I'm actually losing quite a bit of accuracy in terms of I'm rounding up and I'm losing, you know, 0.3 or 0.5 or 0.75 or whatever of the uh, units that are, you know, valid. Maybe I'm supposed to have uh, that much accuracy. But generally, one or two decimal places gives you a nice balance of not aggressively overrounding, but not just printing out too much stuff that's confusing the reader. It's a lot harder to read 17.6866 than 17.7. .7, and the difference is minuscule. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I work with a lot of um, 
social science data and the I don't remember who who I heard saying this, but the the best advice I've ever heard is um because the da- the tables that we that I tend to work on are for a lot for like policymakers or stakeholders and nonprofits, you know, to measure kind of how effective their work is. It's would an additional decimal place change some decision that they would make in terms of, um, you know, how they implement the policy or, or that type of thing. And if so, include it. If not, then you're okay to to round to, you know, I, I kind of default to the same thing, like one decimal place. Um, so it's, another, it's a, another good way I've found at least to think about it. So in terms of the code, um, so I know that you have, I'm guessing these are the two things you've done here. Um, so explain why you only had to do that twice. Like, how do we get Yeah, this so what one? I will say is part of the beauty of GT is not just that it's changing the visual component of the table, but it's actually working with the data. And R itself has really good tooling for uh, working with data and presenting numbers and other things. So uh, the default behavior is kind of like, you know, about right. Like it's going to give you one unit of accuracy for uh, for a column. Um, you can format that number and say like within this entire column, you know, round them all down to one decimal place or extend them out to three decimal places or whatever you want. And there's even functions for like converting dollars. You could imagine like if this were $17.7, it makes zero sense to have $17.6866. Like that, that just is kind of silly. Um, but 17.70 or $17.70 is an appropriate level of precision for dollar sign. Um, the other one, and to your point of like uh, policymakers, should you print out something that says, you know, there were one thousand or one hundred and fifty two thousand three hundred and forty six dollars and fifty seven cents spent on this or should it be one hundred and forty five K? Like you can actually use GT to change this very long stream, with probably too much precision to we spend about a quarter million dollars, like 0.25 M and that's 0.25 million or 2.5 million as opposed to two comma five zero 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 comma zero zero zero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just so I understand the code, like if I comment those out and rerun this, um, it's going to run, it'll create all of these columns because you're the, the way, well, let me even run up to here. Um, this is the, the data. So it's GT will just display the data that given to it. So in other words, the, the data that right. we showed before has all of these decimal places. GT is not going to change that. But when you add these uh, FMT number, and I know they're, you know, FMT dollar and other options as well, that's how you can change the presentation of those yeah, yeah. Uh, so decimal places. It's going to give you the defaults and maybe so the defaults are too permissive in terms of, again, I don't want four units of precision here. If you have a tool where that's appropriate, yes. Right. Um, but you can control all sorts of components through the format functions. And there's more, again, there's more than just decimal places. You can um, you know, scale them down. So divide them by a thousand or divide them by a million with format number. You can apply it only to specific rows. You can have it ignore NAs or missing values. Like there's a lot of times where you're going to be formatting the data um, beyond just changing the decimal place. Cool. All right, let's go to the last one. Whoops. Publish. So the last principle uh, we'll discuss is grouping similar data. Um, Let me run this code and look at the data that we have. So we've got country, crop, and then a couple years data and percent change. Um, So your bad example is this. Let me go ahead and run that. Um, Just briefly talk about what what do you think is bad? So if you uh, hover over the country and crop columns, um, this is where I think that it's problematic. Um, Basically, you have repeats of country and repeats of crops, but nothing is grouped. So 
you can't really, the only comparison that's really appropriate right now is what's the max and do other countries decrease from that? That's basically how it's been sorted is the United States has the largest crop yield potatoes in both years. But then when you try and go down, you're like, well, United States soybeans are really low, but what about compared to the rest of the world? And you're like, I think it's higher, but what if there's soybeans at the top? And you're, again, you're bouncing around within the table too much. So to make this a more purposeful table, I would probably group those variables and essentially say, well, I'm going to make a decision and the purpose is to group it by country. So within a country, what are their crop yields? And that will still make it easier to compare within a country as well as between countries because they'll be split out from each other. So run that and we'll take a look at it. So just all, all you did co from a code perspective to group it is you added the group name call. And let me even run, like, just if I run it yeah. with, without any formatting. And again, the, the default is good. Like, I would accept that, that default so and be like, yeah, I'm pretty okay with that. The other theming yeah. I've done is mostly yep. just even probably taking away too much just to highlight that there's groups. Um, but that default is good, and it's grouped the data into each of the different countries. Right. So we can see if I rerun it with all of your theming, it does some bolding, changes some of the um, divider lines, etc. So that's one way you can, in you know, a line of code, add that grouping. Um, another thing you talked about was mm -hmm. removing duplicate data. So just to go back and kind of remember, this is what our data look or our table looked like before. And then if I scroll down here and run this, let's look at how you did this. Um, so talk about what you did and how you so removed. I really like how here. GT has like a baked in way of doing group data. Um, other people might be used to this format where you essentially delete several rows and that indicates that there's a group. So basically because there's missing data below China until you hit India, that means that all those other rows are China. And that's just a decision. It's not necessarily bad or good or the right or the wrong choice. That's just how you want the table to look or how your readers expect the table to look. And if you show them the other one, they're like, well, this isn't what it was like net last week. And they might get annoyed and you got to work up to it. So sure. what we've done here is just said, if the um, row is not the first one within each group, then change it to a blank. So it's just basically not printing anything in those uh, columns. And I think that's line 530 through 536. Um, the text transform function is, I don't know what else to say besides it's bonkers in terms of the stuff you can do with it. I mean, that lets you say <laughs> like, with the actual value in that cell, do anything in R. There is no limitation, anything you want to do in R. So that's how, like with other packages, you can add graphics or symbols or JavaScript or HTML or raw LaTeX. You can do all sorts of crazy things. For this basic example, we're saying take the text that's there and transform it into something else. So for the uh, column where it's country, basically the country column, and if the row uh, of crop is not equal to potatoes, then put in a blank there, essentially. And exactly, and that's potatoes, potatoes is the first is row first. in every uh, every group. So obviously, if you had a different table, you couldn't use that exact code, but just some logic statement that says the first row by group do this. And it could be a dash or whatever else you want. It could be uh, fill it with background color. Um, but with text transform, you can literally do almost anything you can think of. It's a very powerful function. Cool. And the reason I like these two is they, they do, these two examples show yep. kind of the same thing, but just different approaches on um, doing that kind of grouping in a non-default way. Because I think, again, like those of us who work with data all day, this, this data looks <laughs> great from like a, you know, tidy data perspective, like perfect. I can work with this. But from a presentation perspective, this or 
this is going to be much easier for folks. Exactly. To, and, and some of the decisions of. you're making here is, do I want a table that's slightly longer or a table that's slightly wider? What is the space you're working in? So what is the format you're writing out to? How much width and height do you want to fit the table in? Can it fit all in one page if you orient it slightly differently? Um, those are the design decisions mm -hmm. we're pivoting from longer data to slightly wider or even very wide data can be a good decision. Makes a ton of sense. Cool. That was that was Thank great. You. You're a very good teacher. Um, done, uh, I've done like, a lot of teaching, teaching on GT. Um, so I've got a lot of workshops I do on GT for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Well, last question I'll ask is, um, whoops, you've developed uh, the GT Extras package. Um, do you want to talk briefly about totally. some things that that does? And like, I'm curious if there's kind of, are there things that we went over that you, that the GT Extras package makes easier or does it just add on additional things to yeah. um, what you're I would say it's GT a mix of both tables. in terms of making things easier or extending it. At, at a technical level, GT Extras is wrappers around GT code. It's all possible by hand with GT. Like the, that's the only way it works is I'm actually using GT code. Um, but by wrapping up what essentially would be like 30 or 40 lines of boilerplate that are essentially the same every single time, I can write a function that does that. So if you go to GT Extras documentation, um, there's what I would probably say is go to the reference for themes. That'll be a, a good one to example. So open up the 538 and the Guardian. Yeah. So these are what I would call like uh, typographic or data journalism inspired themes. You can imagine that the default theme for GT with the gray and thin dividers and specific fonts is fine. And I actually really like it. But there's a reason that 538 or the New York Times or the Guardian or whoever else themes their tables in a certain way because it's their brand or they think that it's a really good way of presenting the data and they like how it looks. Um, so this, these themes are many, many lines of code. They change the fonts, they change the dividers, they change the bold and italicize and remove and add specific components. And I don't want to type out 40 lines of code for the theme every time. I want to just call, you know, uh, GT theme New York Times, and it does all those changes at one point. So those out-of-the-box themes, I think, are one of the most compelling examples because um, I really like how they put those together. And if you actually look at the code, it's GT code behind the scenes, um, but it's, you know, it's just a lot of repeats, and I don't want to type it out by hand. So, yeah. So this is the... Mm -hmm. the New York Times theme. And so, yeah, basically this, so this about is the 34 code, right? lines that of code. Way. And again, like that right. code never changes, right? It's always the same. So that's a good time to wrap it into a function because then I can just call that code verbatim. And it literally takes an existing GT object, uses GT tab options, GT tab style, GT tab style, and it repeats to change all these different components with specific fonts and typographic or stylistic changes. Um, the other compelling thing for me, cool. if you go back to the documentation articles, is th again, this merging or that. this idea of uh, making tables and visualizations work together. So you might think of like spark lines and that's really a lot of time people are like, oh yeah, I've got a table. I can, I, I'm used to spark lines and whatever, like that I can see what is the trend over time. I don't really care about the exact values. I just want the graphic showing what, what things have changed. So again, with, you know, one line of GT code or GT extras, GT spark line, it'll convert all of those values into a spark line by row, by group within the context of GT. Or if you wanted to plot like a distribution, you can actually scroll down, you can do density plots or histograms to actually show the distribution of everything. 
And again, like this is a good summary table. I, I don't need to show a graphic that has four encodings within a very small space. I can show you the right. exact groups, the mean, the standard deviation, and a basic representation of the distribution all within a compact table. Cool. Yeah, that's great. I see you got inline bar charts, percent charts. I don't even know what a win. Oh, I've seen this as win loss charts. So yeah, th those yeah, were the most. That's great. The original creation of the package was about I wanted to apply my own themes consistently rather than having to copy paste code around and around to do the formatting. And I wanted to embed more graphics into the tables and make it robust against unexpected user input. And that's what a function is for. Sure, I could have a function that only I can use. Cool. Uh, and only I know how to use it properly. But with a package and with GT Extras, it protects against unexpected inputs. So if you try to do it wrong, it won't let you. It'll say like, hey, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Change the data to this format or it'll only let you do it within within the context of a GT table. 